The United States tries to avoid defaulting on its debt. Can it avoid an economic crisis? Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu and this is The Heat. The United States is now just weeks away from what the Treasury Secretary warns could be an economic catastrophe if it fails to agree on a deal to raise its debt ceiling. That's required so that the country can continue to borrow and doesn't run out of money. President Biden met with congressional leaders at the White House this week, but there was little progress. The United States is now facing the prospect of major economic fallout as soon as the beginning of June. For a wider look at what all of this may mean for the U.S. and the global economy, we begin with this report from CGTN's Nick Harper. The era of easy money could be about to come to a grinding halt. No deal on raising the debt ceiling will have staggering consequences. The various rating agencies will immediately uh, cut the rating of, of the United States. And that, economists warn, will shake global confidence in U.S. Treasury bonds, causing their value to drop. It will be a blow to the reputation of the United States, and especially the reputation of the bonds of the United States, which are considered by the markets for many generations uh, as completely risk-free. That could trigger a meltdown in global financial markets prompting U.S. companies to implement mass layoffs to prepare for the possibility of a deep recession. At a time when the cost of living remains high, tens of millions of people, including retirees, may not receive their monthly Social Security benefits, and government employees, like the military, may not get paid. What are they going to do without these checks? How are they going to pay the rent? How are they going to pay for food? How are they going to pay for transportation when they have to get somewhere? A default could prompt the United States lenders to raise interest rates, with that borrowing increase potentially passed on to consumers, making mortgages and credit card rates more expensive. But most experts agree the dire consequences will ultimately motivate lawmakers to act. Neither side really is eager to see a default. I think in the end, if we're coming to the deadline and, and they're still at an impasse, my guess is that they'll find a way to extend the time limit and give themselves more time to talk. Now a nervous wait ahead of the June 1st deadline. That's the date that the U.S. is expected to run out of money and be unable to pay its debts, a scenario that Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, says will cause an economic and financial catastrophe. Nick Harper, CGTN, Washington. And our full reaction to all of this, joining us here in Washington is Eleanor Clift. She is a political columnist with the Daily Beast. Also with us from Miami is John Quelch. He is a professor at the University of Miami's Herbert Business School. With us too from Oregon is Yan Liang. She is the Endowed Chair of Economics at Will Emmett University. And from Los Angeles, we're joined by Ryan Patel. He is a global business executive and senior fellow with the Drucker School of Management at Claremont Graduate University. Welcome to all of you. Eleanor Clift, uh, the clock continues to tick down and what some are calling X date. That's the day the United States could default on its debt. And we're being told that that day could be as early as June the 1st. Now, as we just heard, President Biden held discussions with the congressional leaders on Tuesday at the White House. Uh, there was no progress reported, but the president came out of that meeting pretty upbeat. Let's listen to what he had to say. I made clear during our meeting that default is not an option. Repeated that time and again. America is not a deadbeat nation. We pay our bills, and avoiding default is a basic duty of the United States Congress. So, Eleanor, the two sides are scheduled to meet again on Friday. Uh, but what does the picture look like? Could the country be heading for a full-scale debt crisis? Well, a last resort would be for the president to cite the 14th Amendment, which says flatly that the federal government is obligated to pay its debts. Uh, that would, of course, uh, prompt a constitutional confrontation that would face legal challenges because it's never been done before. And I don't think the president really wants to do that. But this is the kind of brinkmanship we're accustomed to in Washington. It happens routinely when there is a Democrat in the White House. When uh, 
President Trump was in the White House. The debt ceiling was raised three times in his four years, and nobody said boo, because the Democrats really understand uh, the perils of default. And on the Republican side, you have uh, a lot of um, newly radicalized uh, members who would consider themselves part of the MAGA uh, coalition. And they uh, seem to think that inviting some sort of default will force the country to face up to its, to its debt. They, the uh, Republicans have offered a number of suggestions for cuts. They don't get too specific, because unless you really touch entitlement programs going out into the future, uh, Medicare, Social Security, you really can't bring the debt under control as immediately as Republicans would like it. And so there's a concern this time that uh, the Republican majority in the House has a very narrow uh, majority. They can only lose four votes in whatever they uh, put on the floor. And uh, if the Speaker goes too far in trying to find accommodation with the White House, uh, he faces possible uh, ouster by his members. So um, he's walking a very uh, narrow line. I still think there's got to be a way out of this with some artful wording. Perhaps they would pass first a package of spending cuts, and then they would pass what's called a clean debt ceiling. They would raise the, the, the limit. They wouldn't officially tie them together, but they would be tied together, and that might be enough to let both sides claim victory. And so this is where we're at. Both sides have to find something where they save face. And it's very difficult, and the clock is winding down. John Crouch, what are the big economic risks for the country if the two sides cannot resolve this? Uh, certainly, as the uh, commentator said in the lead, um, the uh, uh, first key problem would be the downgrading of uh, U.S. Uh, credit and U.S. bonds. Uh, this would immediately impact interest rates throughout the system, uh, making uh, loans to business more expensive, uh, making uh, mortgages and automobile loans to consumers more expensive and uh, risking a very significant uh, recession. Um, I think in addition to that, uh, Anand, uh, on, the, on the international front, uh, we have seen more and more questioning of the dollar as the settlement currency of choice internationally, and uh, uh, anything like uh, a problem around the renewal uh, that we're talking about that's necessary on June 1. Any problem relating to that is likely to give grist to the mill to those who wish to uh, further invade the uh, space that the United States dollar is in a privileged position uh, where it's settling uh, in dollars 90, 95 uh, percent of all international trade transactions. So there is a domestic confidence reduction threat here, uh, as well as a material threat to uh, interest rates, etc. But there is also the international reputational threat uh, to the dollar as the uh, preferred trading currency. John, one other question, um, and this is a constitutional issue, but why does the country need a debt ceiling? That's a very good question. Uh, I think that uh, it's embedded in the notion that the United States uh, Congress uh, has budgetary authority and it represents a certain part of the check and balance system that is inherent in the U.S. Constitution. Um, but uh, the level of difficulty that's associated uh, with uh, the sausage being made in Washington these days uh, is such that a tremendous amount of energy and oxygen, political oxygen, is drained out of uh, Washington if uh, we have this annual uh, song and dance. And uh, that energy and oxygen could be much better and more productively devoted to uh, um, 
policy discussions that address the real problems that Americans are facing. Ryan Patel, uh, President Biden had more to say on the impact of defaulting on its debt uh, during a visit to New York State on Wednesday. Let's listen to some of what he had to say. According again to Moody's, 8 million Americans would lose their jobs, including 400,000 New Yorkers alone. Our economy would fall into recession and our international reputation would be damaged in the extreme. So, Ryan, uh, I mean, yeah, you hear the president saying the uh, economy could fall into recession, millions of people could lose their jobs. How concerned is the U.S. business community about what's going on right now? Well, I mean, they have to be somewhat concerned. You have to have a backup plan. They've gone through this before, and, and believing that the politicians are going to come together on this, this is not – obviously, the market's reacting to what it is. You're going to have a decline in equity prices. We're starting to see some loss of – I mean, you don't want to get to the point where you've lost consumer and business confidence, and that's where the businesses are paying attention to this. You know, President Biden, in that clip that you mentioned, talked about the Moody's report. You, you think about if they do go into default, it will hurt, you know, large concentrations of federal workers in a number of places, in a number of states, right? And I think many businesses that are around, we think of Florida, Ohio, Pennsylvania, California, D.C., there's a lot of operations around there that will hurt the consumer um, you know, consumer confidence, but also the appetite behind that. So I think at the end of the day, businesses are, are, are looking at this and paying attention that X date is approaching um, and, and, and trying to get a sense on where it's going to have as of this week. There isn't any good news. So as soon as you start to see on an, a break on either end, then I think the business community will start to either breathe, breathe with a sigh of relief and or start having their backup plan in place to, to start, you know, saving money on, on their operations. Eleanor, as you pointed out a moment ago, this has become very political. Uh, President Biden has slammed the Republican uh, House Speaker, Kevin McCarthy, saying, or accusing him, rather, of being beholden to uh, right-wing extremists in his party. McCarthy, for his part, came out of that meeting with Biden not very hopeful. Let's listen to him. Everybody in this meeting reiterated the positions they were at. I didn't see any new movement. The president said the staff should get back together, but I was very clear with the president. We have now just two weeks to go. So um, Washington is currently going through a very divisive period right now, Eleanor. Um, I mean, is this posturing um, or could the negotiations break down altogether? Well, it's posturing and it's there's an assumption that in the end they're going to find a way. Uh, as the president uh, said, there are staff people working on either side and, you know, finding some artful language around so that each side can come away feeling that they've had a win is important. But um, President Biden has challenged Speaker McCarthy to specifically identify the cuts that he wants. He wants, for example, to uh, pull back the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed uh, mainly by Democrats in the House and Senate, that includes important investments in, in climate. And there's no way the president can agree to do that. And so Biden has then said to McCarthy, well, you're calling for across-the-board cuts. What would that mean for veterans programs? And uh, McCarthy got his back up and at one point in this meeting called the president a liar. And that, of course, leaked out. And when McCarthy was asked about it, he if he called the president a liar, he very proudly said, yes, I did. So um, he's got a faction within his caucus that uh, really, I don't think they care if the government is implodes and uh, the, not just the U.S. economy, the world economy uh, suffers. And because he has so little uh, leeway... Yeah. Uh, there's 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 concern that he's he's going to he's he's going to take this to the brink and then go over it. So this is the first time in my memory in Washington where there's very little, if no belief, that in the end surely they will find a way out of this. People are really nervous this time. Young Liang, great to see you. Uh, there are also concerns about the impact this could have on the global economy. So look at, let's look at the big picture, the broad impact it could have on the global economy. What could that be? Yeah, good to talk to you, Anand. So I just want to address 
you know, I, I think this question, you know, from the global outside of the U.S., I think people are looking at this as, you know, as it is. It's a political theater with disastrous economic consequences. Um, so, you know, according to the White House uh, Council of Economic Advisors, if we enter this protracted default scenario, that this is going to cost the U.S. 8 billion jobs and half of the stock market value. And even if there is a last minute deal um, in the so-called brinkmanship uh, scenario, that is good, still going to cost 200,000 jobs in the U.S. That's worth a month's job gain. Um, so the economic consequences are really serious, and that definitely have the global ramifications, right? So there are many central banks are holding the U.S. Uh, you know, treasuries in their foreign exchange reserves. You know, those um, bond securities could lose a lot of values, um, not to mention the entire global financial markets are going to be affected, you know, because the treasuries are held as collaterals in many of these financial systems. Um, not to mention, you know, the real consequences, which is, you know, if the U.S. goes into a deep recession, yeah. this is definitely going to hurt the rest of the world. Now, what is I think one thing needs to be clarified is lifting this debt ceiling does not authorize any new spending. And in fact, it just allows the U.S. to finance the existing you know, obligations. It right. just allows the U.S. to pay the bills that have already been incurred. Yeah. So I think from the rest of the world, this is really a true test of the U.S.'s political system yeah. um, if there is a deal to be done um, quickly and efficiently. So, Yang Liang, what about uh, China? How closely is China watching this? I mean, these two countries, uh, well, they make up the most important economic and trade relationship in the world. Yes, absolutely. I don't think, you know, China is going to happy uh, to see, right, this kind of uh, desolate debacle, um, you know, as it is unfolding now. Um, China is interestingly, in, uh, you know, featured in, in the debates, right? The Republicans are saying, you know, the Democrats are trying to lift the debt ceiling. That's just going to, you know, send a gift of money in terms of, you know, uh, in the forms of interest payments to China because China is holding, you know, um, $849 billion of treasuries, um, you know, second largest foreign holders of the U.S. Uh, treasuries after Japan. Um, but, of course, the Democrats would accuse the uh, Republicans are now damaging the U.S.'s, you know, dominant currency position. So it's interesting that China China is featured in this kinds of domestic political uh, political debates as everywhere else yeah. um, in the political debates. Um, but again, I think from China's point of view, um, they don't like to see the U.S. default, um, not because not only because this is could um, affect their treasury holdings and cause some value losses, um, but also, you know, as we just mentioned, the two countries are deeply entangled uh, in their trade investment business relationships. So if the U.S. does enter a deep recession, this is not going to be good for China or to the rest of the world. That said, I think China is in a good, good position in continue to diversify its foreign exchanges, which it has been doing since 2014. Yeah. Um, their, you know, peak holding has gone down from 1.3 trillion the U.S. Treasuries uh, back in 2013 to now close to 849 uh, billion. Um, so I think it just makes China um, to sort of confirm that it is the right move to diversify. John Cox, we've been talking about the real world impact a default could have. Uh the country not being able to pay its debts, the fact that there'd be no money uh, to pay federal workers, there'd be no money to pay social security payments, etc. But economics, of course, is also about perception. And what kind of impact would this have on the reputation and credibility of the United States? It would be devastating. Um, it would be uh, uh, without precedent, and um, it would uh, undermine a tremendous amount of brand equity that the United States and the dollar has uh, built up over um, more than 250 years. So I think we're talking about something that is really so cataclysmic uh, uh, in the magnitude of impact that uh, it, it, it's simply unfathomable, as President Biden has implied, uh, that this can happen. And I thought it was very interesting, actually, that both uh, Mitch McConnell and President Biden uh, used exactly the same words uh, to the effect that it cannot happen and it will not happen. And I'm sure that uh, the sausage-making machine, as Eleanor implied, will find a way to uh, uh, obfuscate, muddle through, and there will be some uh, compromise that uh, will not necessarily link um, spending reductions to uh, the approval of the debt ceiling, but uh, behind the scenes there will be an arrangement made.
Ryan, we've been talking about that Moody's report, and it also says, as Yang Liang pointed out a moment ago, that a long standoff could see stocks drop by a fifth, and there could be a contraction in the U.S. economy by 4%. So what impact could a default have on stock markets, not just here in the United States, but also around the world? Yeah, let me take a, a simple example. If you think about if, if, if we do go down this route, you're going to see a reduced demand of imports from, let's just say, Europe and Asia from the U.S. That's going to hurt countries that heavily export to the U.S. So that means the U.S. demand for the products go down. So what does that lead to? That leads to less profit, leads to consumer demand starting to come down. We already have an issue of consumer confidence already. And if you think about Europe in general trying to still stabilize inflation, throw that in there and throw a little bit of mix of the bank turmoil. You kind of have this this recipe of something that really is going to push this thing that would be maybe a snowball effect to further and down. So the market's already fragile how it is. They're already looking for some kind of good news to be consistent. Um, we, we start here in the U.S. We saw the CPI report inflation, you know, starting to still peak down, but things are still higher than it is. So we're no longer the U.S. It hasn't even fully recovered yet. And when you kind of entangle their economy into the global economy, it does have a uh, a domino effect, I hate to say it. And I think that's part of where businesses are going to look at, even if they're not global, they're going to see the demand and look at those numbers. So um, it'd be very interesting on to, to see how this plays out. But um, you, you will feel it. Other economies will feel it should we get to the other side of the default. And again, I'm hoping we don't get to that conversation, but you will feel it short term. Long term, it's, it's, it's not a pretty picture. Yan Liang, as China's economy continues to grow and we see uh, developing countries' economies emerging as well, there's been increasing talk, and we've heard this for a long time now, about seeking an alternative to the United States dollar as a reserve currency. When we look at what's going on now with this debate and these talks over the debt ceiling, I mean, could that fuel calls and for a, an alternative to the U.S. dollar? Well, I think so. I think, you know, the 2008 financial crisis has taught China a, a, a major lesson, right, which is if you have a large exposure um, to U.S. dollar, U.S. dollar denominated assets, um, that puts yourself in a vulnerable position. And that's when China started this diversification efforts. And now I think, you know, with uh, Russia being excluded from the U.S. dominant financial system, right, the SWIFT system, I think more countries are joining, you know, this sort of um, the efforts to um, diversify their reserve currencies and also their vehicle currencies in their trade and business investments. Um, you know, uh, uh, Brazil and Argentina just signed a sort of agreements with China in uh, using yuan as some of their trade settlement currency. And China itself has also rebalanced um, its cross-border transactions. Um, yuan now accounts for 48 percent of its cross-border transaction, transactions, and dollars uh, share has gone down to 47 percent. So I think that just, again, made countries understand that, you know, uh, it's better for them to diversify away from, you know, the dominant, dollar dominance mm. system, um, just in case if, you know, there's any value losses or any policy moves on the U.S. part, um, that could definitely hurt their own interest. Now, going back to the question about the alternatives, the options for the United States, I think for sure, um, you know, Biden wants to work with the, the uh, Republicans party in order mm. to, you know, get this deal done. But that is not the only option. I think it's still better for Biden to put, you know, all the options on the table, mm. even do, you know, consider, for example, mint the trillion dollar platinum corn, right? I know that many people consider this as unserious, but let's not forget, you know, yeah. 2020 uh, Michigan Congresswoman uh, Taleb brought it back um, to the scene, to the, into the discussion, yeah. um, and, you know, challenged the, the, the sort of constitutionality of that debt ceiling. Um, I think there's other options, like even, you know, selling premium bonds in, 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 you know, in exchange for the current bonds and so on and so forth. But the point is, you know, there is leverage um, on the part of the White House, on the part of the Treasury. Um, so hopefully that could elevate, you know, their bargaining chips, their bargaining power and get some deal done. Eleanor, you were talking about uh, the politics of all of this earlier on. Um, and we are now in the early stages of the 2024 presidential campaign, although there are many people who will say that it never stops. The presidential campaign is a continuous cycle. Uh, but how damaging would it be for Biden and his prospects if there is a default? Oh, he can't let a default happen. I think he then does invoke the 14th Amendment and then takes it to a constitutional confrontation. If he does manage to navigate through this with some artful wording or a deal of some sort, 
then it validates his whole claim to the presidency that he has all this experience. And if there's a deal to be made, he knows how to make it. So I think there's opportunity here for him as well as peril, and uh, depending on how, how it sorts out. And I would point out that and the Republicans in the House, mm -hmm. there, yeah. a, a portion of them do not believe that default would be that serious. I mean, they think it's all uh, a game that's been played by the elitists to stay right. in power, and they don't believe it. And so uh, it's we don't have sh a shared reality here in Washington, and that really does complicate things. John Crofts, there is some good news for the economy. Inflation eased slightly in April, according to the latest figures. Uh, but, you know, we look at the overall consumer price index, it's still up 4.9 percent, almost 5 percent. I mean, how would you assess the overall health of the economy um, and the risks of a recession? Uh, so in, independent of uh, this uh, debt uh, issue, um, I think that the economy is actually coming around pretty well at this point. Um, there's debate as to whether or not an extra uh, 25 basis point increase at the next uh, Fed meeting is going to be necessary. Uh, but we are seeing uh, reductions in the inflation rate. The unemployment uh, level is still uh, low, um, even taking into account the fact that there's a certain uh, significant number of people who, of course, dropped out of the mm -hmm. workforce, uh, retired during the, uh, during the COVID era. But uh, employment, especially in the service sector, remains uh, robust, uh, not so much in manufacturing. Yeah. Um, I, I would say certainly relative to uh, G7 economies, the uh, U.S. is uh, doing pretty well, and especially compared to uh, certain European countries, United Kingdom, for example, has uh, an inflation rate that is still uh, very high relative to the U.S. So. Uh, we're doing pretty well, and uh, you know I have to say very quickly, Anand, that uh, the U.S. is always the engine of uh, innovation, and out of every downturn and right. every recession, there has always come new companies, new entrepreneurial initiatives that have fueled the next wave okay. of innovation and economic growth. Okay, we have to leave it there. We have run out of time. Thanks to all of you for being with us. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thank you for watching.